Good morning uh, and good evening, everybody. And welcome to today's session on, of the conference on our theme, ethics, law and governance. So in the first session for this theme today, we have a, a panel discussion titled Moving Beyond the Consent um, or an Anonymize um, Dichotomy. My name's Judy Allen and I'll be your session chair. Uh, I'm sitting on the extreme southwest of, of Australia uh, and I'm sitting on Wadandi country. Um, it's the traditional owners of this country are the Wadandi people of the Noongar Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders for their wisdom and for their care of this beautiful country. We have three panellists this morning. We have Associate Professor Angela Ballantyne, Dr Elisa Red Miles and Associate Professor Man Zwati. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing them on the topic of today's panel, uh, moving beyond consent and or anonymize, or the consent or anonymize dichotomy. So our existing legal and ethical framework are both based on this assumption that consent is required to use people's uh, individual personal information. And that if that's not possible, then the data should be anonymized. So this is currently reflected in research practice. And it's assumed that if you have consent to use the data, um, or if you can't consent, then you should anonymize. And that if you do either of those, then all is well, ethically and legally. But this assumption is now under intense scrutiny. So in this session, um, each of our panelists are going to speak for um, an introductory session section, and then we're going to move to discussion mode. So we're looking forward to everybody's participation in the session. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to put your questions in uh, via the question and answer uh, function as soon as you can, or whenever you think of them. So we're looking forward to your, your questions. So I'd first of all like to introduce Associate Professor Angela Ballantyne. Angela is currently a visiting senior research fellow at the National University of, of Singapore, but her permanent position is at the University of Otago in Wellington. In Singapore, Angela is working on public perceptions and ethical issues associated with precision medicine, particularly in relation to data sharing with uh, the private industry. Angela's interests include research ethics, especially issues of justice and vulnerability, medical ethics education, the ethics of pregnancy and reproductive technology, and also and importantly for today, data ethics. She's worked in the schools of medicine, primary medicine, primary healthcare and philosophy internationally, and has been a technical officer for the genetics and ethics at the World Health Organization. Angela, would you like to speak to us first of all? Thank you. Kia ora koutou, good morning, everyone. So thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. I'm really looking forward to hearing the other panelists. I want to start just by making my slides move. There we go. So I want to start by putting this issue of consent and anonymity in context. Why do we have these tools and what is the problem that consent and anonymity are aiming to resolve? The essential problem is a really fundamental clash between public benefit and individual rights. And it's important to see that this isn't just an issue in relation to data research. This is a fundamental ethical clash in relation to public health and research ethics as well. So the public health example is I think very kind of visceral and fresh in everyone's mind at the moment. There's somewhat of a trade-off between public safety on the one hand and liberty and freedom on the other hand. Uh, if you wanna maximize public safety, sometimes you need to use coercive state powers, for example, in Singapore, um, to require masks, to require the use of safe entry technology mechanisms whenever you enter public spaces. On the other hand, if you want to prioritize liberty and freedom, that sometimes comes at the expense of public safety. In the research context, uh, there's absolutely a priority given to autonomy in this space and autonomy is seen and consent as a uh, necessary kind of fundamental before we engage in the pursuit of knowledge and research. There are a few exceptions that are allowed in relation to use of deception and research, uh, research with adults who lack capacity to consent for themselves and consent waivers. But the basic assumption is really that you will get consent before you do uh, research with human subjects. 
in the data space, we see a tension between social value and privacy. So social value uh, in relation to data research speaks to the prospect for research and innovation, new uh, inventions, and in relation to public policy, a real focus these days on evidence-based public policy. So using population level data to inform government decision-making so that that is really based on evidence rather than just political ideology. Consent and anonymity are useful tools to try and resolve this fundamental tension or ethical clash. Anonymity works by severing the link between the data and the data subject so that there is no longer a privacy threat when we use data. And that's why anonymized or even de-identified data um, is shared much more broadly. And in fact, many jurisdictions allow a lot of flexibility in the use of de-identified data. The challenge here is that anonymity is becoming technically increasingly impossible, and I would argue kind of already is. We shouldn't be telling people that we can anonymize their data. Now, consent's a different type of tool. Consent, what consent does is that it brings the personal perspective and the social value perspective into alignment. So rather than them being in a kind of clash position, they are aligned. And that's because when we get consent, we're asking individuals to opt in to the um, data research process and check whether their values and goals align with the project. So these are why consent and anonymity are useful tools. Today, I want to focus on why uh, some of the challenges around consent and perhaps some of the alternatives moving forward. So we can put all of the different consent options on a spectrum. At one end, they emphasize privacy and individual autonomy. And at the other end, they emphasize the social value of the data use or project. Specific consent is obviously the most demanding. That's where all of the material and relevant information is presented to data subjects and they have the option of choosing whether to participate in the data use. Dynamic consent is a kind of variation of this where, re, where data subjects can use, often using a web platform, continually update their preferences with regards to the uh, data use. Blanket and broad consent sit in the middle. These are where we can offer specificity regarding future data uses, but we still ask people generally to consider how they would feel comfortable having the data used. These are often the tools we use at the moment. Um, they don't do the heavy ethical lifting that specific consent does, but they're a nod towards autonomy. Down the other end, we have opt-out options. Now, opt-out really shouldn't be called opt-out consent technically, uh, but it's, a, uh, I suppose, an approach that focuses on transparency and giving people the option to opt out of that data use if they don't agree with it. And then in some cases, we actually have other authority mechanisms in place of consent. And this could be permission from an IRB, for example, or perhaps a surrogate decision maker making a decision on behalf of an individual regarding how their data is used. The problem we have here is that specific consent does the kind of heavy transformational ethical work uh, of aligning those two considerations of privacy and social value, but it's really impractical. And the options that are more practical tend to emphasize social value and many people think don't sufficiently uh, acknowledge the considerations of individual autonomy and privacy. I want to ask why we think individual consent might be necessary for data use. It's reasonably obvious why it's necessary if you're going to enroll in a human subjects research study, but why is it relevant to data use? The first answer is that people often assume that individuals or patients own their own data. It's been said that data is a product of the patient's body. So I've just recently um, written a paper that challenges this idea. I argue that clinical data at least is co-produced. So if you were to take uh, a diary entry that the patient had written about their sore stomach and compare that to their electronic health records, the content, the information would be really remarkably different. And the data that we want for health research is typically that written by the clinician, not the patient's diary entry necessarily. And the reason that differs is because of the intellectual labor and effort uh, contributed by the clinician who questions the patient, filters the patient's information, uh, interprets and translates and essentially writes that clinical record. Certainly when that record is uh, also includes uh, slides and images and blood work, that's a lot of intellectual labor that the medical team has contributed. 
It's true that the data is about the patient and therefore the patient has relevant interests with respect to how that data is used. But note that the data is actually also about many other people and many other things. So the clinical data tells a story about the health and well-being of the family, whether this is infectious disease data or genomic data, it tells a story about community well-being, about the health system and how that health system is functioning, where the bottlenecks are, for example. It tells us information about the treatment, and that's why real-world data and phase four uh, trial data is really relevant and useful. It tells a story about disease progression, and it tells a story about the clinician's practice. Take, for example, the use of surgeon report cards in the US. So many other people and groups also have relevant interests in that data use. So I think it's not just a question of whether we get consent from the individual data subject. The second reason that people think individual consent is necessary is because they see the primary potential harm from data misuse accruing to the individual. So that might be a privacy breach, um, information about you is shared in a way that you don't want or don't agree with. It's important to note that actually a lot of the harms that relate to data use are group harms. So it's true there is an individual threat to individual privacy. But group harms include, for example, uh, the way data is used to allocate resources. So if you think about in uh, recent debates about ICU, ICU triage documents for COVID, that's a data-based analytic decision-making tool to help guide clinicians to identify who will most benefit from ICU. And what we found there was that those tools discriminated against, fairly or unfairly, uh, racial minorities, black patients, higher weight patients. So it really has an impact on groups' ability to access resources, the way we use data and the tools that we develop based on that data. I think we're all familiar with the degree to which AI uh, can entrench biases. And that happens because AI recognizes patterns in the training data and, th and that data comes from our existing health and social systems. And includes all of the gender and race and weight bias that is within those systems. Data can also be used to stigmatize groups. We had a case in New Zealand where genomic research uh, identified what became termed as the warrior gene. And this was used by some to explain uh, higher incarceration rates for Maori in New Zealand because they were genetically more aggressive than other populations. And data can also be used to exploit vulnerable groups. So you can think about the example of the really sort of predatory recruitment of low-income individuals into for-profit universities in the United States based on data analytic tools. All of these harms apply to groups whether or not their data was actually used in the data analysis and whether or not that data was, was de-identified. So I personally am less concerned um, with individual consent for data use and think that some of the strategies going forward that look promising focus more on group responses and consideration of group and collective interests in data use. There's a whole range of options here, including governance mechanisms, memorandums of understanding to clarify expectations when data is shared, authorization groups such as IRBs, research ethics committees, data access committees, and the use of metadata so I'll just finish with this example by a team led by a colleague of mine in New Zealand, looking at the use of indigenous genomic data and research. And there they suggest quite this kind of innovative idea of using metadata tags on that genomic data, indicating for future users what is within and outside of the acceptable scope. This is a technique we use for cultural artifacts in um, art museums or um, galleries where we can include cultural tags that relate to the acceptable cultural uses of that material. So I think there's a range of interesting options here. I guess my final point would be, I know some people are interested in coming up with one solution that applies across the data ecosystem. I think the data ecosystem is much more complex than that. And actually there's a range of interesting and viable alternatives that might differ depending on the specific sector involved, or the type of data that's being used. So I'll end on that. Um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing the subsequent speakers. Thank you, Angela. That, that was very interesting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the further discussion on it. So those of you out there um, who would like to
add some questions or some comments on Angela's papers, please do so, so now and we will come to those questions um, after we've heard from our other speakers. So our next speaker is Dr. Elisa Redmiles. Um, Lisa is a faculty member and research group leader at the, of the Digital Harm Group at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. She additionally serves as a consultant and researcher at multiple institutions, including Microsoft Research and Facebook. Dr. Red Miles uses computer, computational, economic and social science methods to understand users' security, privacy and online safety related decision making processes. Her work is featured in popular press um, publications such as Scientific American, Wired, Business Insider, Newsweek, Schneider on Security. I'm, I'm totally unfamiliar with these, <laughs> these publications, Elisa, they're way outside my, my field, um, and has been recognized with multiple distinguished paper awards at the US ENIX Security and the John Carrot Usable Privacy and Security Research Award. Dr. Red Miles receives her, received her BS cum laude, MS and PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland. And as a graduate student, she was supported by the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, a National Defence Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship and a Facebook Fellowship. Welcome, Elisa, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Judy, for the introduction. Uh, so in my uh, short introduction talk today, I wanted to talk about how responsible data use can sometimes go beyond privacy, so going even beyond uh, kind of consent or anonymize. Uh, and I'll talk about some work that our group has been doing uh, looking at how we can respect user preferences in COVID-19 technologies, um, particularly around privacy as well as in other areas. Uh, so as Angela mentioned in her talk, uh, computational problems kind of require constant decision making, right? So whether we're doing data analysis or we're building machine learning systems or we're creating contact tracing apps, uh, we have to make decisions about what features or what data are fair to use and um, which we should prioritize. Uh, and typically, right, it's experts who set best practices. Um, so they determine when users should be asked about particular data uh, or what the appropriate standards are uh, or what features should be created. Uh, but one of the problems that arise in this is that, um, you know, when experts trade off, say, benefit to public health from um, using or sharing some data against the risk to individuals, um, their trade-offs may not necessarily agree uh, with users' trade-offs, right? So an expert may feel um, that a particular benefit to public health might be worth a particular risk to individuals um, or to groups, uh, as Angela mentioned, but users may have sort of different uh, preferences. And this tension between sort of experts' uh, views and uh, end user or citizen views is a tension that came up long before uh, we were doing big data analysis or developing uh, computational systems. Uh, this is actually something that came up in moral philosophy when people were trying to design governance systems, right? How do we decide on the laws? Uh, do we want to um, appoint certain experts who are going to prescribe what the laws are? Uh, or do we want our experts to sort of learn from non-expert preferences or behavior and then infer best practice uh, from that preference or behavior? Um, and so descriptive ethics approaches where we actually learn from users uh, in order to figure out what's appropriate to build for them uh, have been used in other areas of uh, you know, health, uh, digital health, and um, in particular in machine learning. So trying to decide what features are fair to use in a classifier that might make a decision about whether someone gets a loan, for example. Uh, people have tried to elicit uh, ethical preferences on what's appropriate to include. Um, in the context of COVID-19 in particular, there's been a lot of conversation about digital contact tracing apps. Um, so sometimes these are mandatory uh, or they may be voluntary, um, but there's been a lot of conversation about what data is appropriate to be collecting. Can we collect location data? Um, is this actually beneficial to users? So on and so forth. Uh, and so in our work, we actually wanted to uh, listen to potential end users. So just kind of general citizens from the population to identify what sort of their ideal use of their data was and how that aligned or didn't align um, with how experts were thinking about this. 
Um, and so adoption in these kind of contact tracing apps um, where people have an app on their phone, it tracks who they've come into contact with. Um, and if they come into contact with someone who later is known to be exposed, they get a notification. Uh, and so in those types of apps, adoption really matters because for every one uh, person who adopts, they may be able to uh, notify all of the people who they came into contact with if those people have also adopted. And so the benefit of these apps scales um, quite exponentially with the number of users. Uh, and this figure shown on the chart uh, is from some modeling work by uh, folks at the University of Oxford looking at the impact uh, that app adoption would have on daily cases of COVID. Uh, and when these apps were first being created, uh, experts were very focused on ensuring that the apps protected user privacy, um, both through uh, sort of consent, but particularly through anonymized approaches. Uh, and so the approach that sort of emerged, at least in Europe and the US as the uh, gold standard was one in which uh, you created a constant de-identified um, IDs for people in an effort to ensure that their data stayed anonymous and no one could find out uh, if they were exposed to COVID um, or if they were the person who had exposed others. Um, and as this conversation was going on, though, there was sort of this increasing question of, you know, is that going to be enough? Um, so users rarely adopt new technology, um, particularly health technology, just because it's private. They want it to do something, they want it to benefit them. Uh, and so there's many possible inputs to people's decisions about whether to adopt um, these kind of COVID-19 uh, health technologies. They are concerned about what are the benefits, who's providing it, do I trust them? Uh, of course, their privacy, mobile costs, is it going to absorb my data, et cetera? How accurate is it? Um, and also how secure is it, which is sort of a component of um, related to privacy, but not necessarily the same thing. Um, and indeed, kind of respecting why people might want to use something or why they might want to participate in a research study uh, is part of respecting their data. Uh, and so we started advocating that just trying to anonymize their data was kind of insufficient. It would be A, insufficient for them to actually adopt, um, but B, maybe was an insufficient level of consideration for actually getting people um, to have their data respected. Uh, and so in order to confirm that people really did care about things other than privacy, uh, we used a series of carefully constructed uh, online surveys to validate and rank Americans' adoption considerations. And we're now doing this work in other countries, but for what I'll present today is uh, in the US. Um, and so we used a, a combination of different survey questions and uh, demographically representative um, panel surveys in order to ask questions that would allow us to rank people's decisions about these COVID-19 health applications. Um, and what we found was that privacy was very important uh, in their decision to install. So if we kind of decompose their um, installation decision, we see that 29% of that decision would be made up by concerns about privacy and data use. Um, but an equal amount of that decision would be made up by concerns about accuracy. How effective is this actually? Um, and in people's sort of open answer responses to their, these surveys, um, we saw themes around you know, respect of data and ethics that were related to accuracy or even to costs. Why is it fair um, for me to have to install this or for researchers to get my data if it's gonna cost me money or if it's not going to help me? Uh, and so there's sort of this interconnectedness where if we were just thinking about the classical concept of privacy, we would sort of have missed 70% of people's considerations, both about installing these apps, uh, but also their considerations about sort of what is appropriate uh, in interacting with them. Um, and so, you know, these survey results allowed us to think about you know, how we can appropriately respect uh, user data, um, but also how we can actually try to, to get more of it, right? Um, and so in order to, you know, ethically collect this data, we want to make sure we're offering um, apps in the marketplace, so to speak. These are um, mostly offered by US states or, or countries um, that offer people benefits that they want and for which they are willing uh, to exchange de-identified data um, for those benefits. And so now we're using um, results from these various types of surveys uh, to do experiments and large scale measurement 
um, where we do field studies observing how well different advertisements or apps that offer different features uh, do in terms of people adopting and retaining them. Uh, and so in general, you know, the, the point of this um, particular short talk was just to, to advocate for the idea that responsible data use can even go beyond privacy um, and is about providing um, technology or research that respects people's preferences and their reasons for wanting to share their data in the first place. Um, and very often, you know, we see that people are willing to trade off uh, between their privacy or the use of their data and certain benefits, be they benefits for society um, or benefits for themselves. And so thinking about what it is that, that people desire uh, can also help us in sort of a broader privacy context. Um, I've briefly listed some of our uh, work on COVID-19 apps and trying to encourage people to adopt them both in the US and elsewhere uh, and look forward to the discussion in the panel. Thank you, Lisa. That was extremely interesting um, and moves our conversation along considerably. Um, those of you who uh, would like to ask questions of Lisa or comments, please remember to pop them into the Q&A uh, section as soon as you, you can so that we can put those questions um, to Elisa or comments to Elisa um, when we get to the discussion part of the, of, uh, the session today. I'd like to now introduce our, our third speaker or panelist. That's Man, Dr. Uh, Associate Professor Man Zawati. Uh, Man is a, an assistant professor at McGill uh, University, Faculty of Medicine and Executive Director of the Center of Genomics and Policy in the Department of Human Genetics. He's also an associate member of McGill's Biomedical, Biomedical Ethics Unit. His research concentrates on the legal, ethical and policy dimensions of health research and clinical care with a social special focus on biobanking, data sharing, professional liability, and the use of novel technologies uh, in both the clinical and the research setting. Uh, so Man, would you like to speak to us now? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you everyone for listening in. Uh, this is probably one of the really rare times where I don't present with a PowerPoint, but I'll, I'll try to make it as, as concise and, but I'm not sure I'll be as eloquent as my uh, co-panelists uh, who presented uh, before me. Um, so I, I would like to talk to you perhaps and start with uh, a bit about, you know, a kind of a background in, in some of the projects that I'm involved in. And I think it will be very helpful for my comments about this dichotomy itself. I, as you heard from the introduction, um, biobanking is a field that I have been involved in uh, uh, very much in looking at the ethical, legal, and policy issues. Um, I'm trained in law, and that's that's my uh, that's my expertise. Um, local, I, I come from Canada, and I'm in the province of Quebec. So Quebec biobanks, uh, Canadian biobanks, and international biobanks as well. And most of those are longitudinal in nature. So we're studying, um, you know, participants over time. And now with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have also established a number of different biobanks, both at the local and national levels, um, depending on the project, but most, most, of the, most of these, if not all of these projects require some form of linkage um, from, you know, with, with health outcome data, uh, medical records, um, you know, governmental databases. Anonymization is not really an avenue that we can take, um, you know, uh, at any point in time. Uh, if you're studying, for example, a progression of a disease over time, you need to be able to cross-check and look at um, individuals' health outcome data as you know their participation progress as to see the changes. Um, for COVID-19 research projects, uh, as an example, um, we in Canada are working on um, sequencing the genome of uh, 10,000 hosts, uh, but at the same time, you would like to link uh, those uh, genomes with uh, viral sequences and generally those viral sequences are held at public health laboratories across the country and only through linkage we will be able to do that. And as you've heard also from the first presentation of Angela the anonymization itself has its own limitations. So what is the approach that we use for these biobanks? It's, it is consent but that being said consent itself is also facing multiple challenges. I'm not going to go into all of the details here, but um, you know, individual consent is there, but at the same time, 
we have been over over the past couple of years used a form of an individualized conception of autonomy that has made consent a little bit more challenging for projects like biobanks. And there are more and more approaches that we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, in, in these days uh, to try to make this as a as much as a multilateral process, then it's just a bilateral between a researcher and a participant. Uh, more and more, we are looking at the interests of, you know, other people that are, might be affected by the data, uh, interests of the public more generally, because most of the times in these biobanks, we say to people, uh, you know, your participation will likely not get you any direct benefits and the benefits are for the public, for uh, future generations. So looking at those interests, looking at the interests of the research community who needs to use these data and samples for future research and so on. Um, and even in Canada, if I take the example of Canada, if we are faced with a situation where uh, researchers have not obtained consent uh, you know, from participants for secondary use of identifiable information, uh, the approach is not anonymization. What the, what the Tri-Council policy statement in Canada suggests, and because it takes into consideration the importance of being able to continue, uh, you know, linking and to, and to use identifiable information, it requires that uh, researchers present to the research ethics boards uh, to their satisfaction, the ability uh, for the identifiable information being essential for the research, uh, that the use of identifiable information without the participant's consent is unlikely to adverse affect their welfare. Um, you know, the researchers will take appropriate measures to protect the privacy of individuals and to safeguard the identifiable information. It is impossible or impracticable. And impracticable is not mere inconvenience, but really something that would denature the research project. It is impossible or impracticable to seek consent from individuals to whom the information relates. But more importantly, it says that the researchers have obtained any other necessary permission for secondary use of information for research purposes. And this leads me to my last point, which I think Angela also uh, mentioned at the end is, you know, that that dichotomy itself is kind of, you know, kind of almost dissipating in some ways and, and putting in place other approaches. And one of them is governance and, and more specifically access governance. We have to see consent, at least from my personal perspective. One characteristic that we tend to forget is that consent is continuous in nature. The form that people sign is not consent. It's a consent form but the process itself is continuous. And therefore we have to find creative and innovative uh, systems to ensure engagement with participants over time. And in, in biobanks, what we do is that we have a governance system an access governance system that you know, um, creates bodies that will adjudicate on access requests, ensuring that people's um, you know, uh, privacy is safeguarded, but also create ways where uh, participants are informed uh, about the use of their data and samples and their ability to withdraw over time, which is a, you know, kind of a, a, a sacrosanct, um, you know, principle in, in research, which anonymization will not allow. Um, and also, depending on uh, the populations that we are involving, for example, Indigenous populations, First Nations in Canada, uh, there are always abilities to create um, a, a structure that would take their interest and have them be on the table uh, to, to give their say in, in access to the data and samples from, from these specific populations. Uh, so, in, I mean, in conclusion, um, there are difficulties with, of course, anonymization. Our uh, research ethics um, landscape, or at least regulatory landscape, allows us to be able to use identifiable information if we are, you know, if we ensure a certain number of conditions, but at the same time, we have to think uh, more in, in, in a more innovative way and think about consent as a, as a continuous process where governance, specifically access to data and samples governance uh, could play a major role in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Van. Let's move now into the um, discussion about uh, between us on this topic. Um, I'd like to throw it first of all to, to each of you in turn to see if you'd like to comment on each other's um, uh, presentations or raise any questions and in a sense discuss it amongst yourselves before we move to the wider questions. Angela, would you like to throw anything in here? Thank you. Um, 
I thought the presentations just did a great job of demonstrating the complexity of the data space and that idea that certain kind of approaches and consent or um, de-identification strategies can work in, in some areas, but not necessarily across the board. One of the questions I had, I guess, for Alyssa and or actually, you know, even for, even for man as well, um, is this, this difference between what people would choose within a set set of criteria and options versus what it is reasonable, what, what sort of choices would be reasonable for people to have. So I think when we say that people are willing to consent to share their data in order to access certain benefits, sometimes some of us feel somewhat constrained by the global data ecosystem to make those choices, right? So maybe I don't wanna be on Facebook or maybe I you know, would rather not that Google had all of my GPS data, but um, if I want to access certain services, that's a requirement. So I think there's a difference between what people yeah, would consent to within a set background set of background conditions versus what those background conditions should be. Um, so just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a, a huge problem, I think, with kind of the broader technology ecosystem for exactly the reasons that you say, right? Like, you can't say that people just can opt out of an online service because we have lots of evidence that being part of that online service gives you social and economic capital that you can't get if you're not part of it, right? Um, and so I think in the case of sort of COVID-19 technology, we had sort of this unusual case where we were introducing this new thing out into the ecosystem. And in a way, one of the reactions people had, right, was like, well, this is a lot more scrutiny than we give all these other services people use all the time. And it has this public health benefit, right? And a lot of the, one of the criticisms I think that's been had is that de-identifying um, data or not collecting location data in contact tracing is a big impediment for like public health purposes. Um, and one of the things that, that our research found was actually that end users would have liked to have that location information as well because they wanted hotspot data um, and et cetera. And so it was actually one of these cases where I think um, like computer scientists or privacy experts sort of jumps down a, a particular path that maybe didn't align with how people were actually thinking about responsible data use and et cetera. So I think that doesn't quite answer your question in the sense that the existing ecosystem is like a disaster, but I actually think in some ways now we're reacting in such a way to restrict, but not necessarily restrict in the way that aligns any better with people's preferences than the existing, you know, ecosystem. Yeah. I guess another aspect of what you um, pointed to there, Angela, is that when we're making decisions individually, we're actually making them not just for ourselves, because the decisions we make have impacts on others. And perhaps this moves into to your area more, man, um, in terms of when we choose to contribute our data, if you like, it means that things are known about other people besides ourselves. Inferences can be made about groups to which we belong and so on. Man, would you like to pick up on that as well? Sure. I mean, uh, just before I, I do, just on the point that, that was raised uh, by Angela, I think it's quite, quite important. I, I also do some research on the mobile health technology and mobile health apps, and I've been very fascinated over the years, the two last years, to be more precise, on um, uh, those applications that, that do symptom checking. And, and there has been studies, really important studies, on the fact that, you know, when, when it comes to choices, uh, we always have to look at the platform that's given to people. And although it might, if you look at the algorithms and if you look at the choices, they might be as, as um, detailed as they can be, the way it is presented to people will affect what decisions they make and you know who's going to access their data. Uh, and, and there's always a one-size-fits-all kind of approach uh, to, to certain decisions that are made that are actually going to be very harmful. Um, so the platform, the, 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 the module in what this information or this, this participation is presented actually matters. The, the, the form here really kind of is quite, is quite crucial. Uh, and to come back to the point about, you know, the, the relatives or the data, I mean, one of the issues that we're, we're facing is, is that, you know, in order to facilitate the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the translational pathway, especially in the field of genomics, we need large set databases, we need to have the statistical, you know, kind of significance, and we have to create these really large 
national databases, but it's, it's, it, it sometimes is very difficult um, when you're doing this retrospectively, when there are already existing and you're trying to put them you know, in together. And then this, this is where you see the issue of anonymization and consent play a very important role because there are some types of research projects where consent was for a specific research project. And you can't go back to the individual anymore and say, listen, we need to put all the data that we've collected into a larger database. Uh, and so, you know, when, when we go back to the research ethics boards, uh, they, they also tell us uh, that, you know, there's always a possibility to integrate that. And I mentioned to you some of the conditions, but one that's really important says the use of identifiable information without the participant's consent is unlikely to adversely affect the welfare of individuals to whom the information relates. Mm -hmm. And that's not just the individual, but, but the problem is that as the research ethics board will are limited in how they're going to be able to decide on that because the only expression of interest that they have is, is the participants expression of interest. And if there isn't anything about data return or research, you know, incidental findings or return of results where we usually ask someone to express whether or not they want to return this to biological relatives, it's really difficult for RB. So there are practical limitations as well for that. I, I don't know if I've answered your, your question, but I thought it would just pre present some of those challenges. Yeah, I guess that with the points you're making are even more um, clear when we're talking about administrative data, which, you know, much of the data that is most useful for in data linkage is administrative data collections that are collected, you know, data collected in the course of healthcare. Um, no real option for um, individual consent in those circumstances. I think the points you're making are even more um, uh, uh, clear in that sort of context. Alyssa, did you want to um, raise any issues um, arising out of uh, your fellow panelists' <laughs> comments? Uh, yeah, I had one um, sort of question, especially for, for Angela, um, based on the idea you brought up of sort of shared ownership of data. Um, and I was curious, you know, at, to what degree you feel like patients sort of conceive of or have the mental model of this shared data, or if you think they might be maybe need education about that or be surprised if someone came and said, oh, actually, you know, it's not totally your data. A lot of other people sort of contributed their uh, mental effort with this data. Yes, I think, I think there's a, a lot further that the conversation can go in terms of how the data is produced. I think, yes, people do have a instinctive view that it relates to me, therefore it's mine. So I think that, you know, there's room for growth there. Interestingly, clinicians often think it's my data because I wrote it as well. So um, you have, you know, lots of these different sort of proprietary attitudes towards the data sometimes. Really interesting example around the concept of group or shared data is one of the DHBs in New Zealand is trialing an approach where, um, and this is driven by uh, some of the Maori health community and advocates in that space, have said rather than having a default towards our health records being individual and owned by individuals and only being able to access by individuals, can we have the option of having far now, that means like broader family health records where we all opt in and then there's like a bubble of health records and anyone within that far now can access and share that information. So that is a really fascinating idea that I think turns this whole kind of individual concept of health data ownership on its head. That's, that's really new in New Zealand. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Even within the scope of kind of an individual approach to data ownership, I think there is an increasing recognition that the data is valuable for the public and for group activities. Um, just a question, I think, of where the kind of nexus of control should sit. You know, is it just is some kind of kind of collective authorization process sufficient? Do you need a kind of collective cons community consultation plus consent, or can you just have individual consent? And that's that kind of balance of power, I think, is where the debate is at at the moment. Yeah. I suppose that raises the question of, of change and perhaps most specifically change in the, um, the context of, of COVID. Um, perhaps throwing this back to you, Elisa, do you think that there has been a change in people's approach in terms of that preparedness to see their their data, I'm using that possessive terms, um, as something that also is publicly, um, well, at least publicly beneficial. So do you, do you see a shift 
And perhaps that's a geographic question. It may be different in different parts of the world. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I think um, I'll comment on the US and we actually have some data that we're still analyzing, looking at how, how whether there's been a shift sort of in um, willingness to have data shared for other purposes, but I can speak for COVID specifically. Um, we have seen a lot more willingness to sort of participate in the collective, which especially for the United States is pretty unusual. Um, so people being willing to actually like actively donate their data. So Apple added this feature to their contact tracing framework, which is the main one that US states are using. Um, and people were like surprisingly willing to do data donation, whereas in past applications of data donation, it's been very low adoption. Um, and so there seems to be this sort of, I'm going to join the fight sentiment that um, maybe changes that nexus of power, as Angela put it, sort of outside the individual um, and toward feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm contributing to this whole and other people have contributed and that feels somehow different than like someone coming and taking my individual data. Um, whether that will result in different sentiment toward use of data for non-COVID purposes, I'm not sure because a lot of what we're seeing is sort of people are like, okay, you can have my data until COVID is taken care of and then you better delete it, um, which obviously has some, you know, health research implications that we might not like, but I think that's sort of the, the mental model that people are operating under right now is like, okay, it's a crisis, I'm willing to give it up, then I want it back. So I'm just um, following up some questions here on this. We had, that question was more or less the question that um, Lauren Staples was asking, but she actually asked for your opinion as whether this is a positive shift or not. Is this a good thing or not? If there's more, less individuality. <laughs> I can let others um, answer that as well. I think from my perspective, um, I, I, I think a shift in terms of thinking of data not as sort of something we're clinging on to because maybe more of it was taken than we wanted to in other cases. And so now we're holding it even when it might have benefit. I think that shift is good where people are thinking about, okay, like what is the benefit to me or to society from this data? What is the risk? And let me reason about that. That said, I think we've been a lot clearer with people um, this time about the benefits and the risks than we are sort of in general when people make data choices. So I hope there's also sort of a shift on the the side of, of researchers or experts in terms of being transparent with people because it allows them to make better reason choices and we're at least seeing evidence that they are trying to do so. Mahan, did you want to come in here with any um, comments on this? Uh, on the panel uh, uh, presentations or, or on that last question? Whichever you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I just really had a, a question, and I, I, you know, and, and I think it's for both uh, Angela and Alyssa, and, and just to have their thoughts on on their work and the engagement of other stakeholders in their work that are not from their own discipline, and and how has that affected uh, their their perspective in terms of their research uh, projects and results? I mean, whether it's someone that's you know in humanities or someone who's in technology or um, if they can, if they can kindly uh, comment on that. Angela, do you would like to pick that up first? Sure. Okay. So this is a slightly, maybe not from a different discipline, but this comes back to the idea around power sharing. So there was an interesting project uh, in New Zealand uh, where, so New Zealand has a really fantastic integrated data infrastructure system for integrating administrative data as well as data from NGOs and other sectors. It's really in the census data, really substantive data collection and linkage platform that allows us to do all sorts of interesting kind of evidence-based research. And at the moment, there's quite strict rules around how people overseas can access that and a lot of interest from overseas researchers because they don't have equivalent data sets where they are to want to run some models on our data set. And that requires kind of not to get into the technicalities, but anyway, interesting rules around collaborating with New Zealand researchers. So to try and sort of test those boundaries, I was running a consultation project, um, our university being selected as kind of a test university to see if we could sign some specific contracts and memorandums to um, broaden international access to this data set. And so we would be kind of the go-between. And we had a lot of pushback from the Maori um, community in New Zealand based on the idea of Indigenous data sovereignty and their view was we don't think that Indigenous data sovereignty has been adequately addressed in New Zealand yet 
let alone sharing this data with researchers outside New Zealand. So the, so the consultation we did at the university, I felt like was quite extensive. And personally, I, I felt comfortable that we had addressed the ethical issues and that my view was that the consensus was that we move forward um, with, with this international data sharing. But we had not been able to get our Maori colleagues on board with that. So the question became, um, what call do we make? And so in the end, we decided that in the interest of kind of a, creating a, a trusted data ecosystem space, we would say no, even though we felt like it was legal and it was ethical, we felt like we didn't have social license within the community yet to move forward. And that I think is kind of an interesting example around, you know, it's not just enough to consult with groups, it's a question of when are you actually going to share the decision making power and what is the long game here, right? So maybe we didn't get to the public benefit of sharing data in that one case, but maybe we make more progress in terms of ensuring that many groups in the community are comfortable with data sharing moving forward. So that was an example where I have felt most kind of mentally stretched in terms of what's the right way forward here. So interesting. Um... Yeah, I think uh, for me, this uh, particular set of work on COVID has been very interdisciplinary. So I come from computer science as a background, of course, and then um, the project has been with both public health departments as well as um, people who come from like quantitative marketing and economics. So there's sort of a, a combination of approaches. Um, and one of the things that I noticed um, when doing this work was that, um, you know, I come from computer science, but tend to do more social science work. And so I often am thinking about, oh, how do you get people to use things? But most of my colleagues are kind of thinking like, oh, I built it, people will start using it, this is the end. Um, and when I started working with some of the public health departments, you know, a couple of them said, oh yeah, you know, we thought we would release this app and then people would know that it benefited society and then they would use it. And I was like, oh, this is surprisingly familiar. Um, and so I think for the the econ and marketing and, and somewhat for myself, we were like, okay, well, why don't we approach this like we would like any other, you know, thing that you're trying to market in a way that's like responsible and ethical. And so I think that was just sort of a, maybe an interesting similarity actually in some ways the opposite of what Angela was bringing up where um, both sides were like, yeah, if we build it, they'll come maybe for different reasons and that's rarely really the case. Um, so can I move you all to the question of, or back, I suppose, to the question of, of change? Um, there's considerable recognition of the problems of, with consent and anonymity, but, and Angela, I think you touched on some alternatives. I guess the question I'd like to throw to all of you is, do you see any change, any um, uh, progress, I suppose I'd say, in moving away from those things to those alternatives. Um, perhaps, Man, can we come to you first of all, particularly I'm thinking of the legal framework, which is fairly um, uniform around the world in terms of the requirements that these are good things, you know, consent's fine, we're fine. Um, if, you, if it's anonymous data, it's not personal information, you're fine. Do you see any change in the legal framework in the foreseeable future in relation to the reliance on those concepts? Um, I, I, I think it depends, to be honest. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that there's a uniform approach, to be honest with you, because even just in Canada, we have, I think we, someone calculated it once, we, had tw we have 27 different laws in Canada about privacy. And, and the mechanisms and the interpretation of each, you know, kind of depends. So we're, we're, we're fortunately far, at least in Canada, from uniformity. I, the way I see it, and again, I come back to the to the focus of you know the the projects, the research projects I'm involved in, the biobanking. I think these are all components that will remain in some ways, whether it's consent, whether it's you know uh, um, privacy safeguards, whether it's governance. But it, I think what we're seeing is a shift towards which one are we giving more space to, or at least um, you know in in our in our understanding of of the approaches that need to be made, which which of those components is playing a major role. And I think at least in the, in the field of biobanking 18 years ago, when we were starting to work on population biobanks, research ethics board who generally, you know, are the ones who interpret these and give the approval, um, took 18 months to approve a biobank because they didn't understand the concept and were stuck with consent as a consent for a clinical trial. And therefore, if we look, take Angela's spectrum, we looked at it from a specific point of view. And we were coming up and saying, well, 
we need a broad one here for the following reasons. And they saw broad as almost like, you know, a blanket approach. And so, and so it took time before, cons you know, consent, the focus wasn't really much on consent, but really on governance because participants in biobanking, they're consenting to a governance system. We're telling them, we're gonna be using this, but don't worry, here's how we're going to deal with it. This is how we're going to protect your, you know, your, your safeguard. This is how we're going to return. This is how we're gonna publish. This is how we're gonna make and do collaborations. This is who is involved. And so basically they're agreeing to a set of governance and so governance becomes a little bit more important in the component. It doesn't remove consent. It doesn't remove the importance of safeguarding privacy. It just puts the focus somewhere else. Angelo, you, you mentioned earlier about the, um, the emphasis in the ethics guidelines, picking up on you know, the role of the ethics committees here in terms of, of approving these projects. Um, the emphasis in the ethics principles on the individual participant um, and their the risks and harms and benefits to the um, individual participant. Do you see any shift away from, from that focus in the, in the research ethics guidelines? So we've recently updated our guidelines in New Zealand and there's more of a recognition of group harms and more of an effort to push consultation with relevant groups. Obviously consultation with Māori um, and Pacific communities in New Zealand is a reasonably well-established part of health research. Uh, but recognizing that other groups might also have relevant interests. I think that the kind of IRB research ethics system is not fit for purpose for looking at data. I think we need to move data out of that space. You can see why it ended up there because identifiable data is linked to the patient and is seen as a type of kind of observational research. But I think it's, you know, committees don't have the expertise around what actually the data risks are or kind of the interests are to, and I say this as someone who has sat on a committee and had to review a lot of these <laughs> applications, don't I think have the relevant expertise around data security to judge what the actual risks are. One thing, and I also think it's, um, I think we over-regulate use of health data relative to other sensitive data, right? So there's a lot of sharing um, of administrative judicial data, education data, tax data that kind of often goes on sort of within government or within the system that isn't reviewed to the same extent as health data. And I think that is unjustifiable, right? So I think health data is equally as sensitive as some of that other data. So I would like to see uh, new kind of government governance and review mechanisms that look at say sharing of public sector administrative data more broadly and moving it out of the kind of research ethics space. Uh, in New Zealand, again, we have the IDI, uh, so the Integrated Data Infrastructure. They have the kind of standard five, five safes review model, which is reasonably cursory. And they have just recently introduced a new review process, uh, which is like a Maori review lens to see if the data affects Maori in a particular way and whether there needs to be group consultation uh, with Māori health experts or other experts before that data can go ahead. So I think we're seeing the data ecosystem shift and move, um, but I think the main problem is still essentially the role of IRBs in this review process. Okay, just follow that up with a question from Alison Paprika. She says, I suspect that the extent to which data subjects and groups trust the data stewards would impact how willing they are to move away from specific consent to broad consent or involvement in governance as an alternative to consent. I'd be interested in hearing the panelists' views on that. And do you want to follow up from that? Yeah, I mean, I think I trust is where it's at, right? I mean, if, it, if 2020 has shown us anything, it is that trust in government and social institutions is country's greatest strategic asset. And countries that have dealt more effectively with COVID is because there is greater public trust in government information and compliance um, with public safety recommendations. Research, for example, from the um, Alderman Trust Barometer shows that all of the major social institutions, so media, government, NGOs, and for the private sector are all now in a trust deficit. More people distrust those institutions than trust them and government's the worst. Um, so we absolutely need to be working on how we, how we can use regulation and governance and transparency to over time try and rebuild trust and data use because I think specific consent is just not going to be sufficient. Mm 
Lisa, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, sure. I, I think I also wanted to kind of go back to, to Angela, what you were talking about before of how we include communities, right? And I think um, that's one of the things that we try to sort of advocate for in this type of what I call like descriptive ethics survey research, which is sort of a way to access a particular um, population's views so that those can be taken into account, right? And so um, to, to both of your points, right, when I have an IRB decision or even a, a policy decision, it's usually based on what an IRB board thinks or et cetera, but it's not actually based on um, what members of groups who might be affected think or even what potential participants think. And so, you know, the more we can kind of integrate that kind of feedback loop where we actually get a representative sample of the population and we find out what they think, I think um, the better that we can align our, our decisions with what people actually believe. Yeah, I think that also reflects another question we've got here, which says that lots of administrative data is used without consent, relying on leg legislative rights to use the data and providing researcher access to only de-identified data. How important is transparency around how data is used? How can we increase a pu public positive narrative about data use? Elise, do you want to, Elisa, do you want to come up, um, answer that and then I'll throw it to Man as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this goes back to something I sort of said earlier, which was, you know, the more that we sort of respect people's ability and right to think about the trade-offs of the data they're giving up um, for the benefits that they get or society gets, I think the happier we'll be because often people make choices that are more lenient um, than we might have in sort of government governance or legal systems. Um, but we do need to explain things to them in a way that they can understand, right? But I think that's something that the health community excels at more than many other communities is explaining, you know, what, what are the rates with which this will be helpful? What is your data going to be valuable for? Can I break down what that data is? Um, and so the more that people have transparency, I think the more tools they have to make sort of appropriate decisions. And that's not to say there isn't a role for experts, um, but part of experts role can be translating things in a way that people find transparent and understandable. Man, do you want to pick up on that? And, and I have to warn you, this is your last opportunity to speak. And perhaps oh boy, if you can focus, <laughs> no, um, focus particularly gonna, on how gonna we gonna do this with administrative yes. data. How do we build that trust and and transparency with administrative that, that, data? That is a very difficult, uh, <laughs> a really difficult thing. And I can tell you in Canada, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have is the ability to be able to access administrative data and actually link it across the country. Uh, it's really difficult. We have to do it province by province. And some provinces actually do not allow researchers to access it except from their own portals. And and, and so there, there there is a, you know, I, I think the engagement is not just with the population. It's also with the different other stakeholders that are involved, ensuring that they really understand uh, uh, the limitations, understand the risks, uh, and, and, and they understand the proportionality of the process. Uh, that 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 needs to be put in place, and I think if we don't that if we don't do that, and we are always um, engaging with them in a very uh, transactional uh, way, I think I think it's it's not going to be helpful if we're engaging with them with the purpose of dialoguing and and creating that trust. I think that's going to make those processes change. But when it comes so, to the parts, man, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt you because we are about to run out of time. And I really sure, wanted no the opportunity to thank you all very much for, for your participation. It's been a, a very interesting session. And to thank you everybody who's out there listening. And I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to all your questions, but um, I hope you can engage out of the session. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.